Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Neil with bikepacking.com. And in today's interview, we sit down with Lachlan Morton, a professional road cyclist racing for the Education First team. Lachlan recently set the fastest known time on the Cocapelli Trail. And last year, he participated in an individual time trial on the Colorado Trail finishing in under four days. Lachlan is an extremely talented athlete and just a solid human being. Uh, we talk all things road cycling and kind of how it compares to ultras. So if you like what you see here, please hit that subscribe button. And if you have any specific questions for Lachlan or myself, uh, please leave them in the comment section below and enjoy the interview. Thank you, Lachlan, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on. You're definitely our first road cyclist, or road cyclist, I should say, uh, on the uh, on the new YouTube channel here. Um, so real quick, I guess, where are you from and where do you reside now? Uh, I'm from a little town in Australia called Port Macquarie, um, which is between Sydney and Brisbane on the coast there. Yeah, I, I lived there till I was about 18. Uh, and then I've been sort of off and on here in Colorado, in Boulder, and in, in Europe as well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, at the moment I'm in, in Boulder, and I sort of split my time between here and, and um, Spain. Okay, cool. I try and spend as much time as I can here. Generally. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah Colorado's good training ground, obviously, with the altitude and whatnot. Is that, uh, and that's where the team is based as well? Education uh, first? They're based, I mean, our big team base is in Spain. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I've just spent a lot of time here. Uh, my parents live in Colorado now. Cool. Um, so it's just, I don't know, it's kind of like home, I guess. Yeah. When did cycling, uh, when did you first kind of explore cycling? Uh, I would assume you were probably a kid. Yeah, I started riding bikes when I was about eight. Um, like... We were big into um, motorbikes and like driving cars and stuff. Um, and uh, our dad didn't, we wanted to race go karts. Um, but my dad wanted us to wait a little while. So, in the meantime, um, my brother joined the local cycle club, um, which was for like a pretty small town. It was a really strong club. Um, there was probably like 200 members or something. Um, and then because he was doing it, I wanted to do it, you know. Um, and, yeah, so that was like sort of show up once a week, do a club race. Um, and that was the extent of it. And then it's just like I, we were we were good at it. So um, I think when you're that age and you're good at something, you just latch onto it, you know. Yeah. Um, and then when I was... Uh, I think 12 or 11 or 12, I saw the Tour de France um, when I was on in Europe, and that was it. I was just like, that's what I want to do. Sweet. <laughs> like, we were sort of doing, like, road cycling was very strange and, like, obscure. Like, you know, like, no one else at school was riding road bikes. Um, but then there I realized, I was like, oh, wait, you can actually do this as a sport. So that's sort of how I my start in it nice that's crazy and your brother also he's he's a racer too still right yeah he stopped racing uh he's been on and off i guess for a while but he stopped racing two or three years ago um but yeah we raced together on on jelly belly for a few years okay so that must have been fun yeah it was sick yeah it was really yeah. Cool. nice nice um, so I guess tell me a little bit about racing uh, for Education First and uh, I guess it, so our kind of viewership uh, isn't necessarily uh, reading about road riding much but how what is it like to ride for a professional cycling team um, like how busy are you uh, what's kind of like the day to day I know obviously it's a little different right now with the pandemic and whatnot but uh, what's yeah. what's what's it like um it's intense. <laughs> um, like, I guess, so the majority of racing is based in Europe. Um, so you sort of there the majority of the season. Um, and you probably race uh, generally somewhere between 60 and 80 plus days a year. Um, so, 
you know, we travel around that. It's usually sort of like over 100 days a year, I guess, on the road uh, racing. Um, and, yeah, I mean, like, the, the level our team is is called uh, World Tour. Um, so that's, like, the top level. Um, so we've got 25 guys on the team. And I think our staff um, pre-COVID was about 80. Um, so... Yeah, it's a big, it's a big operation, yeah. you know, and it's like the level is really high, um, and it's it's a lot of fun, um, and I love it, but it's really intense, you know. Like at that level, it's sort of like you show up to a race, um, and you've got a job to do, you know. So you're like you're hired for a reason that you can play a part in helping, you know, someone win or trying to win yourself or whatever whatever that job is. So it's it's vastly different from um, putting some bags on your bike and just you know, pissing off into the, yeah. <laughs> the bush. Right. I can only imagine. I was trying to like put myself in your shoes a little bit. Um, and obviously, it's, it's almost impossible to do. But um, I bet just kind of going off and doing these, these rides like the Cocopelli and the Colorado Trail is a nice little escape from all that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Um, like, I sort of... I started, because uh, I was riding bikes from such a young age, in I guess probably my early 20s when I sort of first turned professional, um, I was sort of looking for something and I sort of found that in like, then it was like just putting a backpack on and like going overnight and doing things. Um, but it's just more like, that. I do that for myself, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's like, for me, I feel like, I, I get so much out of it personally, um, and there's no uh, there's no reason for me to be doing it apart from the fact I like it. So um, yeah, I, I'm like yeah, I, I love that. Um, cool. So like road road cycling, is sort of I guess more work. Like I mean, it's a job I really like, but I, it's definitely a lot more um, a job, I yep. guess. Oh yeah. Yeah, I get it. Um, so I guess what? So you've done one Grand Tour, the Vuelta, right? Is that? I mean, you do a lot of uh, racing in the United States. Tour of Utah. I've kind of did a little bit of research today, and um, I guess before we dive into the more of the adventure stuff, what what's kind of your biggest personal uh, accomplishment on the road? I think the one that sticks in my head is uh, winning Tour of Utah. Uh, in 2016, I think it was, um, just because I like, so I, I, I turned professional, like world tour professional when I was 20, um, and was just too young, you know, and like had no idea what I was doing. And I spent a couple of years doing that and then just was hating it. Um, so I sort of just made the decision that I needed to like step out of that and come race in the US and just sort of. Um, find my love for it and like that was a it's pretty hard to do that and then come back to it you know so I was sort of prepared to walk away from it Um, and then I was with Jelly Belly which was just like basically a group of 10 mates and only two staff and um, probably half getting paid a little bit but like you know just everyone in it for the for the love of it Um, and yeah, we, we managed to like come together super well as a team that year and and take down some big some big names in that race. So that was nice just because of the group of people I was involved with, I guess. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's I didn't know you won it that year. That's awesome. Yeah, it was cool. Um, so yeah, let's just dive into some more adventure stuff. So I guess what's the what's the protocol for you when you want to do something like this? Do you have to let your team know? Especially like if you guys are racing, like last year when you were doing the Colorado Trail, um, and not doing like road races. I'm sure there's road racing that you could be doing at the time. So what 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 does that entail? Like, what do you have to do? You have to uh, talk to the chain of command, and how does that all work out? Yeah, it's a bit of like um, generally, it kind of involves me throwing out like ten ideas, and then maybe one. <laughs> okay. Okay. The Colorado Trail, I kind of. Um, I pulled that one on them a little bit, um, and that yeah, there are a few people weren't too happy about that. It's like if I have um, 
like road commitments, I guess um, they kind of traditionally like have taken precedent. Um, but I mean, they're really the teams like EF like they're really good about you know this whole um, I guess world away from road cycling, um, and they and they've they've been really good about getting involved in that. Um, so I guess initially it was harder because it's sort of like well, why would you want to go do that? <laughs> and then um, they've, they've, they've got it. Um, so, you know, like Coca Pelli, for example, they were jazzed on that because, yeah. like, there's nothing going on. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> like, they're like, get out there, have a crack. Um, yeah. So, no, I mean, for, like, as far as World Tour road teams go, like, they're amazingly supportive. <laughs> you know, cool. but that, yeah. yeah. That's awesome to hear. That's probably, yeah. it's probably not the case for some other professional teams out there so definitely i think you're in a good spot yeah i, I mean that it's a, like that's a lot of the main reason i joined the team uh, because i would have that like flexibility i guess sure um so yeah let's uh let's dive into coca pelli um i guess really quick before that what other bikepacking adventures have you done um do you try to like fit one in a year or something like that yeah i usually do um, I guess it's hard to say. probably a couple a year. Yeah. Um, like I try and have now, like everywhere I, I try and have at least like you know a bag and a few things I can take and just get out. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess it started like I said when I was a bit younger and just in Australia I just started like when I was back in the, in the off season I would just if I had to go to like Sydney I would just ride there. And sort of take the long way and take a few days, you know, with like a backpack and, mm-hmm. you know, stay in a caravan park and do that sort of thing. Um, and then I did a big trip with my brother to the middle of Australia. I guess that was like the biggest trip, like the first really big trip I did. Um, and then when I was in Europe the first time by myself and like was having a hard time, um, that's that was sort of my escape. I like... I had this little trailer <laughs> um, that, like, yeah. um, Dave Zabriskie, who was, like, an, an older professional, he left to me. He had this, like, grocery trailer. And I was like, oh, I bet I could fit this on my bike um, and put it on my bike and then, like, went to Decathlon and got the cheapest tent I could. And, nice. like, I would just ride out to, like, the Pyrenees, which was sort of, like, 100K away and, you know, like, camp somewhere out there and come back. And even if it was just, like, a night, it was just... Um, it kept me sane, I guess. Yeah, I mean, like, nothing... I'd never done anything huge, I guess. Just probably more like one, two-night trips. Um, yeah. It's, be- it's better than none. Totally, yeah. Um, all right, so Coca Pelli. Um, so, obviously, just doing a... I checked out your website. You did kind of a questionnaire beforehand, and it sounded like you had no intention of breaking the record. Uh, but you did want to go fast, and I definitely appreciate that. Um, so your final time was 11 hours and 14 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's impressive. My hat's off to you. I've I've done it once uh, in a put in a long push, and I didn't get anywhere near that. So um, I definitely uh, I can understand how difficult that is, but um, I can't even imagine how difficult 11 hours was. So. That's that's pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, why? I guess what was like the initial reason? Where did you hear about the Coca Pelli, um, and why did you want to race it? I sort of stumbled on it with um, my brother and another road roadie, uh, Taylor Finney. We were yeah. riding Moab, um, and we were like basically trying to connect Grand Junction and Moab, and we were just on road bikes, um, and. We ended up getting on there just behind uh, Cisco yeah. on those like kind of sort of sandy, a little bit rocky tracks, and we were ripping along there. Um, and then we just we didn't have enough bike <laughs> to ride the whole thing, um, so we, we like shut the, down the gorge and the on the road. But um, we were all like, "What was that trail?" Because we could see it was like it's marked. Um, it's just got the funny little logo, you know, and like um, so. Yeah, I, I researched it a bit after that, but that was probably five years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've always thought that'd be a good one to do because it's not like insanely long. 
you know, I'm like, I could, if I had a weekend, I could go and do that. Um, and it's close, you know, like to get down to like Fruita from here is like four hours or something. Um, so, but it's just always like, it's never worked out. Right. Like, and then when, uh, when I came back here, I was supposed to race Cape Epic and then that all got canceled and I ended up coming back here and I was like, Oh, what could I do? Um, and I was like, I'd love to go ride Kagapelli. And that was when I first got back two months ago, two and a half months ago or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I actually sent uh, Kurt a message and was asking, like, how early you can ride it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then he sent me, like, the the snow reports, like, where to watch. And then was basically like, oh, after, when this goes to zero, like, you got two weeks. Yeah. Um, and then it'll be dry. So I was kind of watching that, like, watching that. Um, it was more just to have something, I think, like an idea that, like, it was such a crazy time, right? And um, because, like, I'd come back from overseas, I was just staying at home and just riding by myself, like, early in the morning sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it was nice to just, like, have that. And then last week, um, I was just, like, well, let's just go do it. <laughs> you know, like I was like, I know, I know, it's been like it's dry, um, and like it's everything's opened up a little bit, and it's like it's it's safe enough to go down there, and I can pretty much stay isolated with the same group of people. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, like that, I just was um, with my wife, and then my brother and um, dad decided to come down, like the night before which is cool and then yeah just got after it nice what yeah. uh what time did you start was that like a midnight start i think that's when i started i remember i started at uh 2 30 2 30 okay um because it was like the day before it was really really hot like 100 degrees in my lab and then i woke up at like like quarter to two and stepped outside and it was already 80 and I was like, oh, no, this is going to be a deep day. Yeah. It was actually just a cloud. There was a lot of cloud holding everything in. Got it. Um, and it was... So you, like, by the time I like scrapped up some breakfast and got up to the trail, um, it was, yeah, 2.30, I think. Cool. Just cool. After, after. Um, and it was, I heard that it was raining like, maybe a little bit before then so that maybe helped at least just with like dust and whatnot yeah i got rain like on top of uh the lascelles okay. um which it was just like you know it's just starting to stick mm -hmm. like i was like oh if, if i get like another 10 minutes of rain here like i'm gonna be walking <laughs> could be bad right yeah. yeah um but no it was just like the perfect amount and then that first descent that's uh that's paved I didn't know it was paid. Yeah. Uh, so like I came onto that and I was like, oh, this is lucky because that was quite wet. So yeah. probably like the wettest point was it was that paved section there. Uh, and by the time I got past that on the next climb, it was I didn't get any more rain. The sun started to come out. And, uh, yeah. Cool. To be honest, it was like I didn't know. I was prepared for like a really hot day, but I just got super lucky with the with the cloud cover. Yeah. Because there was only like probably two hours out of the whole thing where the sun was really out. Um, and that was, yeah, I was like, oh shit, this is a <laughs> real deal. Yeah, that's nice. How, uh, how, so it probably didn't get over 100. It was probably like in the 80s and 90s then. Yeah, by the end it was like, it was getting up over 90. Yeah. Um, but you know, like once you're in that last section, you got to sniff and it's yeah. just like, oh, yeah. I can make it now. Yeah. Uh, how much water were you carrying? And uh, did you filter water out there? Yeah, I, I filled water out there. I started with, I basically had three liters um, I could carry. And I started with the full three liters. Yeah. And yeah. Um, just basically I was drinking as much as I could um, the first section until Dewey Bridge. So I got through all my water by there and then, yeah, filtered it a couple of liters there and then just had like the one of those life straws as well so i could just suck out a whole bunch of water um right there and then i, f I filled up again i was about 30k later you know and you sort of you come back along 
the um, Colorado River there. Yeah, so yep. like kind of that last section there, you get close to it. Yep. Um, yep. And in between that section, I broke my back wheel, had to do a change, uh, put a tube in there, and I just did a, a like. It wasn't a bad change, but like I was just m- mucking around a bit, and so I was yep. like probably sitting around for ten minutes or so, and. At that point, I, I was like, I, I probably got enough water. I was like, I could just push through here. And I, but I was like, had the rational thought. I was like, wait a minute, just stop, fill up. And I like drank a lot there. Um, and I'm really glad I did because otherwise I would have been in trouble. Because yeah. I, I filled up again at that Salt Creek, I think it is. Yep. It's only yep. like 20K from the end. Or, uh, oh, yeah, the uh, Salt Creek, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you didn't stop at uh, the ranger station? No. Okay. No, I kept going there. Because um, I had, at that point, I still had, like, a full bladder and maybe, like, half a bottle. So yeah. Um, yeah. I knew I could make that Salt Creek, um, but I was pretty thirsty when I got there. <laughs> I had, had a little sit down and a good drink there. Nice, yeah. So you had a flat tire. You you basically I cracked my rim. Oh. Um, so like I about I thought it was a flat. Um, I sort of came down this rocky section, just like a little bit hot, and sort of slid the back wheel. And I could ju- I could sort of see the rock, and then you know when you touch it, and I was like, ah, oh, please no. And it sounded I was like heard the ceiling coming. I was like, ah, oh, it must be a sidewall. Yeah. And then stopped and like the sealant was just coming straight out the side of the rim and I was like oh this is bad and I was like the only thing I can really do is like like I, I just decided immediately I was like, I'll just put a tube in it and like pump it all the way um and just see how long it holds and so that's what I did um and it just like it miraculously held up that's awesome I, I wrote it yesterday. It was still going. <laughs> it was West. wild bubble in the side. Um, and for like, that was when I, had, I first had to put my headphones on because I didn't want to hear like any any noise my bike was making. I was like, oh, it's going to break. It's going to break. It's like, you got to stop thinking about it. So that, that was when I finally put the headphones on and was like, okay, just like if it goes, it goes. Like there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Was it a aluminum or a carbon rim? It's a carbon rim. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Wow. Yeah. It like, just... I, I looked at it again yesterday in the morning when I was cleaning my bike, and I was just like, how the hell yeah. did that hold on? <laughs> like, you got but lucky. It was, but also, yeah. like, it's one of those things It's my fault. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was like, the way I was riding, like, you well, open right, yourself up to that, right? You, you, like, I was always you try and get to that point. And I was just like getting halfway through and was getting that idea of you're like, okay, you need to start like emptying the tank a bit. Um, and yeah, like it was just that one section. I, I knew I'd made the mistake. So like, you know what I mean? It's like that's time that like it's not unlucky. That's just part of that. If you, if you choose to ride that way, you open yourself up to that sort of thing. So. It's a good point. It's a good reminder too. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so did you have any other issues out there? I heard something about uh, you. your uh, light wasn't working at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. That was, again, totally my fault. Because, um, like, to me, like, I'm super – I'm not the most organized. Um, so I was kind of, like, throwing everything together the night before classic. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. you know, you've only got, like, four hours to get up, but you're still, like, trying to do things. Um, and – I just like I must have just pulled my headlight off early or unplugged it or something because I, I I was sure it was ready to go so I put it on my bike the night before and then started um, and like it was trying to switch off the high beam all the time and I, I knew because the Colorado Trail I made the same mistake well I'd put it in my bag and it had come on and I was like ah oh, no this is gonna go out real soon. Um, and so, yeah, it probably died after half an hour. And I had a headlamp, um, but it just wasn't nearly enough. Um, but, I mean, as you know, like those first two or three hours, it's a lot of just climbing. So it was only like those little descents um, right. where I was like 
kind of squinting for it. <laughs> yeah. Like, around the corner. But, yeah, no. that, that Sand Flats Road, that lasts like two hours or something like that, hour and a half at least. Yeah, and it's funny when you... It actually, like, doing it in the dark was quite nice. Yeah. You know, because you're like... I feel like if you were going up that road in the light, you, it would feel slow. Yeah. You know, so you would you'd be inclined to, like, go harder than you probably should mm -hmm. because it's dark you just kind of like you only have your own feeling so you're like oh this feels about right yeah you know yeah. that's a good point yeah um cool so overall coca Pelli went well what did uh what did you eat right afterwards uh i went to uh wendy's on the way home nice. i've never been ever so, I, no i have this <laughs> i have this thing with uh with my wife there's so many like american fast food like chains we've never had so like i have we have a system and like have them all written down the ones we've got to check off yeah <laughs> so, and then we rate them and then we saw a wendy's on the way home we're like oh sweet like two birds one stone tick, tick off coca Pelli and wendy's in one day yeah do you do you <laughs> feel like you can get a uh a actual good reading on uh how it tastes when you're uh post the coca Pelli trail oh, no. Yeah, I was like straight away. I was like, "This is definitely an eight point five. And Rachel like gave me the look, and she was like, "I don't know." And I was like, "No, eight point five. <laughs> yeah, that's how I always feel when I have food, uh, fast food like that after a big race. It's good, but it's yeah, it's not that good. Yeah, it's been, like during the the ride, I, I only ate um, you know like those payday bars. Yeah. Um, that was like. I don't know why. I, the, the day before, I was like, "This is the thing I need." Yeah. <laughs> so I had like, I just had like a front bag full of paydays. Um, well, that's actually a good I'm treat. Sick of that, like sweet, you yeah. know. Like by the end, I was just dying, and they're kind of salty too, so they make you like thirsty as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I was yeah. like, eh. But at least you weren't dealing with melted chocolate like a Snickers bar. That was my plan. Yeah. Um, yeah, because Snickers would be my go-to, but I'm like, they're going to last like 20 minutes out there. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, congrats again on the, the Coco. That that was quite a feat. And yeah, uh, you mentioned Kurt. So Kurt Refsnyder, he had the previous record. I think it was yeah. like 11 days, 42 minutes, or 11 hours, 42 minutes or something like that. But yeah, um, yeah Kurt's a good dude for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's jump in quickly to a few CTR questions. Um, honestly, dude, you crushed it last year, all things considered. Um, so you were, a, you were one of three people to go under three days, by the way, or four days. Right. Which is... Man, to be honest, like, at the end of uh, the Colorado Trail... I would, like couldn't even think about it. You know what I mean? Like I, di I didn't even take stock of the time. Like the last few hours, I was in so much trouble. Like I've never. The, the only time I was in more trouble was on day two, like of the same event. Um, yeah, I mean that's such a beast of a, a trail. You know what I mean? It's still like I had like such an amazing experience, um, but I'm still like a little bit scarred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it is it's a brutal route um what do you all right so i guess like yeah give me your just a quick like a few minute synopsis of how it went like from day one to day two don't go into depth i just want to know like what yeah. how the how the days were and kind of what went south and then how you kind of recovered yeah i mean um like i think the the thing was i didn't have a plan at all i just knew that i was like oh, i gotta get to Silverton um, to get food and I was like then I'll just see what happens <laughs> you know what I mean um, so basically I, everything was going well um, and I was pushing like pretty hard not really knowing you know what I mean I was just kind of going along at a pace that I was like oh this is like normal sustainable um, but on that trail it's not yeah. And also just trying to ride everything, like had this idea in my head that like walking was like failure. Yeah. When the reality is like once you get off, like just accept it. Um, and so that first day sort of culminated in like me being at the high point there, um, right when I wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> you know? Car so, yeah, Carson Saddle, 13,000 feet or so. 
Yeah, so I was up there like around midnight, I guess, and um, like thinking like, okay, this is about when I want to go to bed. But I was like, I can't sleep up here. And then you're sort of stuck on that plateau there. Mm -hmm. So I had to push way further and then um, tried to sleep but couldn't really, you know, sort of lay there for like an hour and a half and then was like, oh, I guess I'll just go. Um, And then paid for that big time, like towards the end of that second day, like trying to get to uh, the hot springs there. Yeah. Um, So that... The last, I, I also miscalculated that distance. So the last 30k um, to get to the hot springs, I was like, you know, full full gas hallucination, just like right off the deep end, you know, um, which was like, it was a, it was a good experience for sure. Like, it was where I finally got to that point when I'm like, this is my absolute limit, you know, um, and. I knew I sort of had to make that section to be able to refuel. Um, but I was so destroyed that, like, the idea of going for a record was totally out of my head. I was like, I'm just going to get there, and then I'm going to sleep, and then when I wake up, I'll decide if I, like, keep going or not. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, as you know, like, if you sleep, I slept, like, eight hours, I think, and woke up, and I was like, brand new. Like, go yeah. back on. Um, and, like... That was great. Next day was going sweet. Felt amazing. Um, I always have that like day three that your body finally stops like fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then I lost my spot tracker uh, somewhere, which like um, I was looking for it for probably like twenty minutes, but I didn't have reception, so I was like, I got no idea where. In the, I was like, I, I know, I know, I saw it like two hours ago, but I don't know. Yeah. since then right um and then like just something like that it just gets in your head right so then you can't stop thinking about it and then um it, i was like you know what because at, at that point i was like i could just push on to the end from here i think mm-hmm. um but i felt like i knew like how worried rachel was that i'd lost it and then like that she couldn't know where i was and then same thing with my parents. So yep. I uh, I stayed in. I slept in. What was it uh, Copper. Copper? Oh, Mountain? Copper, Copper Mountain. Yeah, 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 yeah. I stayed there and then slept like another full night and then just like knocked out the last day. Um, and the last day was great. Um, like I sort of everything clicked. I started to understand the trail, and you know it gets a lot more rideable there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I felt like at that point I finally sort of worked out what it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then I had a great day until the last few hours where I, like, smashed my headlight, and then my headlight, I mean, f- f- smashed my uh, front light, and then my headlight died. Yeah. So yeah. I just had my um, my iPhone light, and I taped that to my bag. Oh, my God. And that, you know, that last section, it's, like, it's pretty cruisy, and then that final descent. Yeah, of Waterton Canyon. It's super, like, it's you couldn't, chunky. Yeah, and like it felt, it felt like it's funny. You see this section, and we come out of nowhere because I've only got like an iPhone light. Um, I was like stumbling around in the dark, and the only thing I could think of was like I can't do another night. <laughs> I was like, I just got to get it done. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I mean that was like the short version of my experience, I guess. That's that's detailed still. Um, yeah. That's funny. I I can actually uh, empathize at least a little bit with. Um, losing a spot tracker um i did that on the arizona trail and i was super worried especially like if you're trying to like set a fast time it's like oh you can't lose your spot tracker that's like the one thing that like you you have the track maybe at the end but you need the spot tracker so yeah yeah, it's just like the idea that like people out there are just going like yeah, he's not, he's not moving. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm fine. Yeah, I'm just yeah. Out here. yeah. Obviously, obviously worrying your your family too. That's a that's a real thing for sure. So yeah, and for me, like on the on the super long stuff, like if any little negative works your way in there, you know, like it takes you it's a good chunk of time to like get past that. You know what I mean? It's a it's I always say it's definitely a little bit more mental than physical, but. 
Um, oh. It's definitely, uh, in your case, I mean, you are just an extraordinary athlete. Like, it's crazy how fast you can go and still sleep and then just go under four days. I'm just like, my mind is boggled. So you probably ended up sleeping like 15 hours or something? Yeah, I think, yeah. That's it's, crazy. I'm between 15 and 18 hours. Um, but to be honest, like, it kind of goes back to the the wheel thing, like yesterday. Like, I don't have the experience to push through, you know what I mean? Like, don't have the experience on the trail. Um, and, like, it, to do so, I would probably fail massively, you know what I mean? So, like, people are like, oh, you could just sleep less. But ultimately, like, I'm not yet experienced enough to be able to do that if that yeah. makes sense yeah yeah no it totally does um and do you want to be exper like uh, experienced enough at some point do you want to continue to do more of these rides or or what yeah i, I love it like Sweet. um i mean the whole reason i did colorado trail last year was i'd done a, a ultra in the uk called gb duro and um when i finished that like the next day I was actually on your website going through events and like, I was like, what's the next thing I could possibly do? And then I saw the Colorado trail race and I was like, I'm going to be in Colorado. That'll be sweet. Cool. Um, so yeah, I signed up for it then and then realized I actually had to race like the sort of Utah and Leadville. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'll, get I'll just do it by myself afterwards. Um, but yeah, I definitely like there's, as you know, it's like, you just like open a can of worms, right? Like you do one thing and then, you know, someone tells you about something else and then uh, it's it, it's exciting and like really refreshing for me because it's, it's such a different world, you know, like... Um, it is. Road cycling is so far, you know, removed from, um, from bikepacking or just most forms of cycling in general. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I, I just love the idea that, like, there's no one way to do it, right? Everyone has their, like, way. Everyone takes different stuff. Everyone has a different style, uh, which is cool because it's kind of like what cycling was, right? Like, yeah. when, it, when it started. So, yeah, no, I'm definitely, um, I'm hooked. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think you're right. Like, and obviously road cycling and bikepacking are, like, complete opposite ends of the spectrum but yeah i think there's some more creativity in bike packing especially if you're trying to race numbers it's um you can kind of cut cut corners as far as like where where can i save a minute here or a second there yeah um, i mean honestly like it took me four attempts on the colorado trail to finally get to where i was like all right this is good like okay. I'm, happy, I'm happy with this 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 outcome but you're all um, yeah. it just yeah it's crazy it takes some time yeah it, it was like um that's the most wounded i've ever been yeah like people are like oh what's harder like a grand tour or an ultra and you're like the grand tour you race for like four four to six hours and yeah it's really hard but then like someone gives you a massage someone cooks you dinner like and you stay in a hotel and sleep for nine hours you're yeah. like forget about it yeah the racing is way harder. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So, are you you plan on going back to the CT or what? What other bike packing routes and ra uh, races you want to participate in? I mean, there's a there's a lot I want to do. Obviously, this year is weird, um, and it's got me thinking. I'd like to maybe just go ride the Colorado Trail again, just because I had um, such an amazing experience last time. Yeah, it's just like take things I learned and go and do it. I don't know if I'd want to do it fast again. I don't know. Just sort of see how it feels. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I also, one, I mean, I want to take on Tour Divide. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of those ones that, like, I've thrown out there and it's been shut down a bit. <laughs> but, oh, I bet. Yeah. It takes up a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, that one, like, I, I think it would just be just the, the scale of it, right, and the length. Um, that one, I think about a lot. Um, but yeah, and also, uh, race to the rock. I really want to do cool in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I love, 
I love riding in Australia. It's like, you know, where it all, all started for me. Um, and that event, and just like the history of like cycling in Australia, it's like that's that's how it all started. It's like that overlanding tradition. So I'd love to go and, and do that one day. Yeah. Uh, but like, I mean, yeah, there's a million. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Is Sarah and Jesse your good folks good over folks. there too? So. Yeah. Yeah, I've still I've still never met uh, either of them, but I look forward to meeting those guys. All right, so I've got to I've got to ask you one controversial question, and it came up yesterday. It's not, actually not that bad, but um, it came up yesterday. Somebody was commenting on Facebook, and they were mentioning something about, "Oh, road racers shouldn't shouldn't be doing these all underground ultras," um, and I thought, "Well, why not?" But what's your response to uh, to that? I I can um, I can understand that. Um, I think a lot of it, for me anyway, it, it comes down to like how you approach it. Um, so like, if I say I went to go to Cocapelli and like treated it as if like I was going to like a world tour road event and had like five staff with me and getting a massage and like doing all this sort of, like, stuff that doesn't really, I guess, in a lot of ways belong in bikepacking, um, then I think that there would be an issue, right? Like, I think it, for me, like, I'm, like, I do my best to sort of um, respect the, I, I guess the, it's not, tradition's not the right word, but just to res- respect the ideals, I guess, of it. Sure, um, yeah. I think yeah, a lot of a lot of racer race directors use like that self supported ethos, and it sounds like you understand that entirely. Yeah, it's just like you're doing it yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and ultimately, like for me, it's not like I, I'm only doing it for myself anyway. You know what I mean? It doesn't affect like the like the the team is sort of hit, give or take with it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not like. Um, I'm like going out. I just want to see what I can do on, on like my own power, I guess. Um, but then, I mean, ultimately, I guess it's not for me to decide. But um, I think, yeah, I, I don't feel like a road racer anymore. So, like, <laughs> I know <if> that helps. <laughs> That's funny. Um, are, so, are you gonna? Are you planning on doing more road racing down the road, um, or do you want to get out of it? I guess. No, I mean I, I, I love it for yeah. uh, for what it is, and like it's cool to jump into a team environment like that that's so professional and so like um, I guess when you go to racing now, it's kind of like going to battle. You know, you do all this scouting on the route, and it's like you got the radio piece, and it's like all right, you're executing your plan. Um, but if that if that's all I had. Uh, and that's all I did. I couldn't. I couldn't manage it anymore. Uh, so, I'm. I'm like the last twelve months. I feel super lucky to be able to do both, because um, I guess like no one's ever really had that opportunity to do that. So like I'm pretty stoked that, that like I'm able to. Um, yeah, I've also sort of at least last year I felt the responsibility to like um, be able to still perform a lot on the road um because i was sort of worried that like if i sucked when i went back to the road they wouldn't let me do them anymore um so like i don't know i was able to do the both of them um and for me that's like a really nice mix right um because it keeps like everything really fresh yeah yeah that's good to hear man i i definitely appreciate all of that that knowledge and um and that stance that you have especially with these ultra races because they are i mean in a way they're definitely like they're small they're underground but there's a a lot of people take a lot of pride in uh in racing them and uh it sounds like you do too so i I know that um that's appreciated yeah i mean it's, it's about like when you're out there you're trying to go fast right but it's like this yeah it's 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 the fact that it is what it is, you don't want to like. Um, I get you don't want to bring road cycling into that. I'm the first to admit it. So yeah. like, that's my stance. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Well, we'll see. I mean, there's there could be some other folks. I mean, the Colorado Trail. That's 
I don't think we'll see very many road cyclists. You're you're obviously a good mountain biker. You're a good bike handler. Um, some road riders might not want to do I'd that. Yeah, I'd love to see Chris Broome on the Colorado Trail. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I do think we'll see maybe a few more folks that uh, are in the road scene that might want to pop on and do like a tour divide or some s- similar style gravel. Like you've done what Dirty Kanza last year, and and that's kind of in that same ethos a little bit. So, um, cool. Sweet. Yeah. All right, my man. Well, this was a really good conversation. I really appreciate uh, you jumping on. I know it, we're a little uh, over the, the time I thought we were going to chat, but uh, oh, you're, right. you're, uh, you're an uh, incredible uh, athlete, and uh, it's, uh, it's always good to, uh, to hear uh, what incredible athletes have to say. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. All right. Lachlan. Yeah, Lachlan. We'll, uh, we'll chat with you soon, and uh, thanks so much.